Howard Blum, The Eyes of a Killer, Part 5. You know how cops work. You know what they look for. You know the questions they'll ask. You know all their tricks. You're prepared. Well trained. After all, you've taken the classes. Earned the degrees. You've gotten in the heads of the bad guys. Written crime scripts, as your profs call them. You learned from their mistakes. But it's one thing to ace advanced crime scene investigations. And it's another to commit a crime. Especially when the crime is murder. What did that boxer say? All plans go out the window once you get punched in the mouth? Seems that holds true for killing, too. Once the knife's plunged deep into flesh. Once the blood starts gushing. So you screwed up. You left the knife sheath behind, on the bed, next to one of the blonde girls. Sloppy. But it's not a catastrophe. You know what the science can prove and what it can't. That's why you were vigilant, meticulous, took precautions. And that's how you're going to keep on acting. That's how you get away with it. Nothing's changed, except they're all dead. first time Brian Koberger walked through a murder scene was in the old stone house on the leafy corner of Taylor Drive in Center Valley, Pennsylvania. There were blood-stained bodies sprawled about the musty, low-ceilinged living room. Only the corpses were mannequins. The blood was red paint. The living room was in the DeSales University crime scene house and he was an undergraduate taking 365 psychological sleuthing. Two years later, on the other side of the country, the Lataw County, Idaho authorities have charged that Koberger, now a doctoral candidate in criminal justice, was once again in a crime scene house filled with bloodstained bodies. Only now, the four corpses in the three-story clapboard house on King Road in Moscow, Idaho, were young college students. The flowing blood was real, and Koberger, they alleged, had been the knife-wielding killer. The more than six-week investigative process that transformed Koberger from a student of the criminal mind into an accused murderer is, in its full scope, a sputtering tale Days of fallow frustration were followed by hard-charging breakthroughs, only to once again come to an uneasy, anxious halt. Until at last, the conclusive incriminating piece would be feliciously fitted into the puzzle. In the end, the headlines exalted. It was a victory of scientific technique. Pure forensic detective work. Yet, while there is a measure of truth to that reductive take, the truth genesis lies in the activities of an unsung group of heroes scattered across the breadth and width of the entire country. If any of their actions, if any of these seemingly unrelated catalysts had not been set in motion, then, it can be argued, things might have played out differently. The secret warriors include a pair of bleary-eyed night shift Washington State University campus cops, a resolute Pennsylvania State Trooper, whose aching memories of a dismembered body stuffed into three battered suitcases decades earlier spurred him into action on a fateful night in the Poconos, and the observant Snake River kayaker, who in 2014 spotted the bloated, decaying body of a woman floating in the fast-moving water beneath the arced steel pans of the Perrine Bridge near Twin Falls, Idaho. A chance discovery that seven years later 
would serve in its heuristic way to sharpen the tip of the spear in the case aimed against Koberger. And, not least, in the final moments of investigative triumph, the load was carried by a group of dedicated and innovative scientists working in a four-story, sun-filled modernistic lab in the Woodlands, Texas. Yet, here too, there were supporting players. Passive, yet certainly no less essential in the broad scheme of things, including a self-made billionaire, venture capitalist, and the complicated man who had first introduced this deep-pocketed investor to the circle of public-spirited scientists. A former Holocaust denier, an occasional internet race baiter, who now claims to do hush-hush spook work as he huddles with Julian Assange in London, slinks around the Middle East, and helps supply invaluable radar equipment to the Ukrainian forces. And then too, looking at the case in purely operational terms, the final outcome, it must be conceded, had a great deal to do with Brian Koberger. He thought he was very smart. And he was, but just not smart enough. A brilliant student. Before getting his comeuppance, Brian Koberger apparently knew a good deal about what makes criminal minds tick. And at least one of his professors enthusiastically agreed. Dr. Michelle Bolger, who advised Koberger on his master's thesis in the criminal justice department at DeSales University, told a reporter, He was a brilliant student. In my 10 years of teaching, she raved, I've only recommended two students to a PhD program, and he was one of them. He was one of my best students ever. Koberger, too, thought he'd learned a lot, and he was ready to put his effortful book learning to practical use In the fall of 2022, during his first semester in the criminology doctorate program at Washington State University, he applied for an internship at the nearby Pullman Police Department. In the application essay, which the Idaho cops later shared, Koberger, with apparent self-affirming pride, wrote that, He had an interest in assisting rural law enforcement agencies with how to better collect and analyze technological data in public safety operations. Collect and analyze technological data? Public safety operations? That's a bit of grad school jargon that boils down to the sort of common sense stuff that is the constant fodder of the myriad TV dramas that begin with the good guys decked out in white jumpsuits Peering down the inquisitive concern at an inert corpse. Inevitably, they move on with methodical earnestness to gather evidence by pulling surveillance camera videos, checking out the cell phones that had pinged off nearby towers as the crime had gone down, and running relevatory license plate numbers through the all-knowing law enforcement computer systems. And Koberger was immodestly asserting that he was a whiz at putting all the disparate data streams to effective use. He could tutor the local yokels. Rural law enforcement agencies was how he put it with the supplicant's careful tact and forensic sleuthing. Only here's the irony. These were precisely the sort of cold, hard technological capabilities that helped to build the case against him each nudged Brian Koberger closer to the crosshairs of the Idaho police. Each reinforced the mounting suspicion that they had identifying their knife-wielding killer. The cumulative evidence was damned incriminating. But it wasn't proof. Circumstantial evidence, however agilely the various threads can be woven together to form a plausible narrative, cannot on their own bind together an open and shut case. Especially if a canny defense attorney 
is determined to pull them apart. In fact, they're not even enough to get an arrest warrant. Take for an instructive example, the now infamous sightings of the white Hyundai Elantra on the surveillance camera footage in the vicinity of the King Road house in the pre-dawn minutes subsequent to the savage killings of the four college students. Kaylee Gonsalves, 21, Madison Mogan, 21, Zana Kernodal, 20, and Ethan Chapin, 20. Within days of the murders, the Moscow police had gathered a stream of video featuring what they quickly dubbed Suspect Vehicle 1. There never was a Suspect Vehicle 2, or for that matter, 3. Only they had a problem with the quality of the images. They were flickering, recorded in varying light. The pixels had captured a fast-moving white car, but that was about all the local cops could say for sure. So, the promising but far from conclusive videos were swiftly dispatched to building 27958A Pod E, Quantico, Virginia. That was where the forensic examiners of the Image Analysis Unit of the FBI Operational Technology Division worked their magic using a bit of software that had been originally developed at the cost of about a million dollars for taxpayers for a secretive Defense Department outfit nestled deep in the clandestine heart of the deep state, the Irregular Warfare Technical Support Directorate. With the click of a few computer keys, the program searches through a staggering inventory of cars until it ultimately, according to the confident government description, identifies the make and model of the vehicle in a still image. And it worked like a charm on the handful of videos the Moscow cops had gathered, or more precisely, three charms. The FBI forensic examiner first deduced that suspect vehicle one was a 2011 to 13 Hyundai Elantra. Then, upon further review, to use the chagrined phrase of the candid Idaho authorities, he decided the mysterious Hyundai might as well be a 2011 to 16. And when he poured over the image of a car consistent with the Hyundai near the murder scene that was caught on camera, not long after the killings racing towards Pullman, Washington, he deduced that it was a 2014 to 16 Hyundai. That is, he cast a pretty broad net and he cast it three times to boot. Still, when it turned out that Brian Koberger owned a 2015 white Hyundai Elantra, it was right in the ballpark of the FBI's analysis of the make and model of suspect vehicle one. But it was a super dome sized ballpark and it had been stretched to cover five full years of cars. A smart defense attorney could drive a fleet of Hondas through a speculative gap that wide and that wasn't all. There was further cause for hand-wringing in the aftermath of the FBI's vaunted forensic image analysis. Despite all the inventive manipulation of the pixels in the video footage of Suspect Vehicle 1, the analysis still couldn't come up with a legible shot of the license plate. They couldn't even offer a guess. They simply had no idea. Even more vexing, there wasn't a single legible image of the driver. The Bureau Wizards tried all sorts of photographic tricks to pull a face from the blur. In the end, however, the best they could do was to cipher a dark, murky shadow hovering over the steering wheel. And you can't slap handcuffs on a shadow. To their credit, however, the tenacious Idaho police went, albeit a bit tentatively, ahead with what little they had. On November 25th, 12 days after the murders, the Moscow authorities, in a judiciously worded appeal, asked local authorities to be on the lookout for white Hyundai Elantras in the area. Four long days passed indolently 
before the campus cops at Washington State University, the school just a 10 minute or so drive across the state line from the Idaho murder house, got around to hunting for the car. How can one explain such a lackadaisical, if not incompetent, response? Perhaps the laid-back language of the advisory failed to communicate the urgency. Still, he didn't need to be Sherlock Holmes to deduce that a very significant game was finally afoot, however veiled the language. The car, very possibly, figured into the still unsolved murder of four students in Washington State was home to nearly 30,000 other potential targets. Maybe this was just one more unprofessional example of the deplorable sort of misconduct that in the recent past had shamed the department. In 2018, Pullman police sergeant had his certification revoked following accusations that he had coerced a WSU co-ed into performing a sex act in exchange for him not arresting her for public intoxication. It's been a year and a half since a WSU freshman came forward and said this man, former police sergeant Dan Hargraves, forced her to have sex with him or a sex act with him when she thought she was under arrest. Good evening. I'm Aaron Luna. And I'm Nia Wong. A warning for our viewers tonight. Some of the details in this case are graphic. Hargraves was arrested for sexual misconduct last October, then resigned from the department a month later. Today, he came one step closer to learning what the next few years will hold. 4 News Now reporter Taylor Graham is in Colfax with your exclusive look at today's testimony. There was a question Tuesday whether or not this sexual misconduct trial, which has been a year in the making, would even continue. I think it's dismissed, no question. As Dan Hargrave's attorney filed a motion to dismiss, saying his client never had sex with the WSU freshman at the center of this case, adding the alleged victim doesn't remember the sexual act. Siding with the state, the judge denied the motion to dismiss, meaning today's expert testimony was still on the table. We heard from Ethan Smith, a forensic DNA analyst with the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, who tested the evidence last year and found Hargrave's sperm, along with two other men's, on the student's sleeve, though he said 83% of the DNA was Hargraves and that this microscope slide reflects that. The defense relied on forensic DNA expert Greg Hampikian for answers. He argued the state's evidence wasn't so clear-cut and that Smith's slide was missing key markers for sperm. There are a lot of things that can fool you. So is this definitely not a sperm cell? No, I can't say it's definitely not a sperm cell. I'd say that it's missing any of the hallmarks that I would that I would give certainty to that too. The jury took in hours of testimony Tuesday and soon they'll have the answers to Hargrave's questions about his future. Yet, despite the snail's pace, at last, a WSU cop did get around to checking out whether any white Hyundai Elantras were registered at the university. It was on November 29th, a particularly tranquil Tuesday night on campus since the university was in the midst of its Thanksgiving break. And at 12.28 a.m., not even a half hour into the start of his midnight to 8 a.m. graveyard shift, Officer Daniel Tingo took advantage of this lull to catch up on a stack of paperwork. Near the top was the bulletin the Moscow PD had circulated. It might as well have been a ticking bomb. Tingo, people will tell you, was one of the good guys on the force. Hardworking, affable, a nighttime supervisor with a straggly, professoral goatee. He pulled in more than 70K a year, considerably more than many people on the school payroll who had doctorates. Yet that night, he earned his pay. For only moments after he read the notice, he started tapping away at his computer. And presto, a name appeared on the screen. Brian Koberger, a grad student living in a university apartment compound on Northeast Valley Road. owned a 2015 white Hyundai Elantra. Dutifully, Tiango passed the baton to his late night patrol sergeant, Curtis Whitman. Whitman was an old guard campus cop who, according to many accounts, 
had been deeply shaken by the decertification of a fellow officer for allegedly extorting sex from a student. In the volatile aftermath, battle lines had been drawn between the cops and the students, and he was determined to do what he could to forge a reconciliation. Too much bad blood, he'd say, had been spilled by the force's all-too-common practice of issuing summonses for chug jugs. It was prohibited to carry open containers of alcohol in Pullman. Rather than hassling kids, he'd reveal with a measure of paternal affection at a consolatory forum with angry undergraduates. My favorite thing is to say hi to students. We want students to feel comfortable with our officers. And so when Whitman got the word that there might be a killer on campus, he didn't waste any time tracking the vehicle down. At 12.58 a.m., precisely a half hour after Tango had initially identified a, a possible owner of the Suspect One car, Whitman was staring through the nighttime darkness at a white Hyundai sitting in the graduate apartment complex parking lot. And the letters and numbers on the license plate were as distinct as those at the top of an eye examination chart. Now they had a plate number to go with the car owner's name. And later, that same morning, they had a face too. Corporal Brett Payne, the 32-year-old former military policeman, who despite his relative youth and short time on the force, had been handpicked by Moscow Police Chief James Fry to lead the quadruple murder investigation, stared at a screenshot of Koberger's driver's license photograph. With mounting excitement, Payne ticked off all the similarities between Koberger and the intruder, whom a surviving roommate had briefly seen in the King Road house on the night of the murders. White male, check. Six feet, check. 185 pounds, check. In the clincher, Koberger, he decided, possessed bushy eyebrows, just as the witness had described. Yet, for all their progress, there was no getting around the dismal reality that the cops were still clutching at straws. Having a likely suspect was not the same as having someone dead to rights. Going to court with this sort of inconclusive supporting evidence, and they'd never get an arrest warrant especially in a high-profile murder case, with the unnerving possibility of a death sentence hanging in the balance. Especially if the judge drove a Hyundai Elantra, or, for that matter, had bushy eyebrows. A wide net. But they did have enough to take the next incrementally small step. And now at least they knew where they wanted to go. Payne, therefore, consciously soldiered on. He had a name which led him to a cell phone number for Koberger. On December 23rd, armed with a search warrant, he obtained the phone's call records for the days surrounding the murder. But the real treasure, the cops wanted to believe, were in the locations of the relevant cell phone towers. Every step you take, every move you make they're watching you and filing it all away be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content and if that's not enough you can join our patreon don't have a tinfoil hat it's okay we'll make you one it's that easy see you guys in the next video see you later bye <laughs>